Hello everyone and thank you for attending our live partner training. We have a loaded panel as you can see for our topic of data protection in the workplace, but more specifically biometrics. What is it and is it secure? I'm Caroline from the customer marketing team here with Phil Gutierrez, the regional product manager for security and docking station at Kensington. We have three featured guests all from Synaptics. If you don't know, they are the leading developer of human interface hardware and software. This includes touchpads for laptops, fingerprint biometrics technology for smartphones, and touch video and far field voice technology for smart home devices and automotives. From their team, we have Lily Wei, the senior product manager, Bo Chen, director of software engineering, and Ray Trent, principal software architecture. Device security. So when we think about devices, um, that are used in the workplace, what comes, what comes to mind for me are the full-on desktops, laptops, tablets like the iPad or Surface Go, and your phone. So let's talk about how we traditionally secure these devices and if we think the fundamentals of security have changed. Um, so Phil, what are ways we've traditionally secured devices and what is the most popular? I would also challenge you to think about like hardware and software um, and things that we've been doing um, and SMB corporations? No, no, really good question. So obviously device security has evolved over a long period of time, right? So I think initially everyone was like, we have to physically secure our devices, right? So that's why even someone like a Kensington like ourselves have, have focused so much on like a physical lock to lock down your device, right? So you have your traditional locking mechanisms there. Um, and then more so, right, we are now officially in the digital age. So what does that mean? So there's a whole lot more of uh, less physical, more data protection, right? Have you seen so much nowadays with larger corporations getting hacked and, and um, stuff stolen? Like this, this is where a, an extra level of uh, security is starting to take place where people are currently, you know, at the end of the day, if a laptop gets stolen, that's less important than the data that's actually what, what's storing, right? So um, now you get into authentication of fingerprints, um, you know, even privacy around, uh, you know, privacy screens, paper shredders. I mean, those are the typical things you see in the office, right? But ele elevating it to the next level of, of biometrics. So this is where you start to see things like where phones and devices and tablets are using biometrics like facial recognition, fingerprint authentication to truly enhance your level of security. So that way you're not getting attacked uh, in, in a digital in a digital lifestyle. Um, would you say that there is a traditional security that um, have been have been used the most in the workplace? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, and I, I'm sure everyone on, on the phone is listening, that at the end of the day, right, the mechanical password for what you use to access your device is probably what's most common in any workplace, right? But of course, that just adds a level of challenges, right? So all those different passwords, you start to have to really think about having to memorize all of them. And okay, you have a password for logging into your laptop, you have a password to log into your phone, you have a password to log into a VPN, whatever that is, it starts to add a level of, and then you have to change it like every 60, 90 days. That adds a level of complexity to your lifestyle where having a level of biometrics, for example, now simplifies that entire ecosystem for you. Mm -hmm. And I, I use passwords every day. I probably have, you know, over 20 passwords just at work, right? Um, there must be a reason for this wide adoption, right? And why we're using passwords so often. Um, Willie, can you tell me um, what are the pros and cons of using passwords in the workplace? I think, first of all, you have to understand a lot of users do not understand they should set up a correct passwords. Mm -hmm. What I mean correct means that you have to set up the puzzle is enough sufficient uh, complexity, otherwise it becomes uh, very multiple to any uh, potential hacker to try to get into your uh, personal devices. Uh, but doing that, that would take away your convenience and your intuitive you tend to remember a lot of set of passwords for all variety of uh, uh, logins. So we do think that uh, they should be uh, something else to ease uh, people's life and instead they can use something uh, like personal ID with them every day, which is biometric uh, fingerprint sensors. I think to piggyback off of what Willie was saying as well, it's like at the end of the day, what people, why do you use just traditional passwords? It's just what we're used to, right? We're human mm -hmm. beings, everyone, and we've been doing this now for so long. This is what we're comfortable with, right? So uh, moving on to a more secure type of environment like biometrics, at, at first, I think just adds a level of hesitancy. 
right? People are just like, oh, I don't know if I should do it. I'm not ready for it. Maybe it's tough. Maybe it's, you know, it's a whole like, elaborate thing. So, I mean, that's kind of the end of the day why we're, why we're all here to so show how, one, how easy it is and the level of security that it now potentially adds to your, to your uh, entire system. Yeah, I would say a lot of people, I mean, even for me, I barely meet the minimum requirements for passwords, right? I probably do just a, a lowercase, uppercase, a number, and a symbol, right? So at work, what if all my passwords, for example, was one, two, three, four, five, six? Um, I would ask Square or Bo, um, are cyber attackers targeting um, vulnerable passwords more so than other types of passwords or forms of security? Uh, attackers do do use uh, lists of very commonly uh, used passwords to attack systems. Yes, um, there's been a lot of data about this. The, the in fact the most common password that is used to attack a system is in fact one two three four five six. Um, I, and I think um, to go to Phil's point, we're at a good time to talk about biometrics because people on their phones have gotten used to using biometrics. So. It's a it's a good time to bridge that gap between passwords, which people are very bad at using, and fingerprints, which or or other biometrics, which people are becoming more, you know, willing to use. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so let's talk about data protection, right? So data loss accounts for billions of dollars in losses every year, as well as potential damages to a company's reputation. So in a recent study that Verizon did, Verizon did in their data breach investigation, it says that 81% of hacking-related breaches leverage either stolen and or weak passwords. So again, if passwords aren't effective at protecting data, what are organizations doing within the parameters? Um, what are they turning to? Is, it, is everyone really just turning to biometrics because of this, or are there other things that they're looking into? Well, I, I think there's a, a very broad topic of security. Um, Microsoft has done a lot of good work to just make the system itself more secure over time, and that has helped people avoid attacks. But yes, I think people are turning largely to biometrics because um, it's everybody has them, they're universal, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they, they provide an additional factor uh, that passwords don't, which is something that the user themselves isn't choosing and therefore it can't choose poorly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So with biometrics, right, um, I think of, you know, your fingerprint, I think of the eye, but what exactly is data protection and what can it do, um, Willie? Data protection is to prevent any uh, uh, people or stranger uh, try to sneak or get into your database and get into your system to steal something you don't want to leak or to let someone else know. And um, so uh, with uh, Windows Hello, that uh, they evolved from uh, using traditional passwords. Now they use uh, um, the biometric uh, identity instead. Instead of that, uh, now users do not need to reveal their password in front of people when they try to log into uh, their their systems. And more going deeper, um, there are uh, uh, we see a lot of the uh, 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 sorry we see a lot of the uh, uh, cyber attack issue back in 2018. Uh, it happens across uh, New York Times, Yahoo or even Facebook, the very, very mm -hmm. well-known issue uh, mm -hmm. case that happened in Europe last year, at all costs and at all costs, a lot of uh, uh, fines and uh, millions of uh, user uh, data leakage. So protecting the data is um, very important today. And to, to jump in on that as well, I think uh, the misconception is there's going to be one solution that fixes all of your data protection problems, right? So I think it's it's more of a solution set, right? So it's, it's not just biometrics, but it's also, right, whether it's identification cards when you access your office, whether it's privacy screens so people can't look over and steal any data while they're right next to you, whether it's even just physically locking down a laptop, right? At the end of the day, it's still help from keeping someone just to walk into your office and take it. So I would look at more of a broad solution set rather than just thinking, hey, one thing is going to solve all of my problems for data protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so a common question, I mean, we talked about how it's used in cell phones, right? We talked about all these large impl implementations, but do you think that bi biometric technology is safe? I mean, after 
Apple introduced its fingerprint authentication on the iPhone. Hackers were able to steal a fingerprint and use it to gain access to a device. Um, I challenge you guys to ask, like, do you consider biometric authentication foolproof? I would ask that to you, Ray, or Tarek, or Bo. I would say biometrics uh, have their strong points. Uh, in particular, uh, they, they are not subject to the weaknesses that passwords in practice have. A password can be a very good protection device if you choose a very complex password, but humans are very bad at that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I guess to answer your question about the Apple uh, uh, people that are using fake fingerprints, there's a couple things to say about that. One is you're talking about a physical attack where someone has already acquired your device before they can apply, a, say, a fake fingerprint to your device. So there's a level of protection just that fingerprints can't be attacked remotely. Um, they, they can be attacked locally sometimes uh, in some fingerprint sensors, but uh, Synaptics technology that you use uh, has very good anti-spoofing capabilities, which we'll talk about, I believe, later. But mm -hmm. Um, that can uh, detect and reject fake fingers uh, versus actual live fingers, uh, so that even the local physical attack is not easy to easy to accomplish. Yeah. So, just, yeah. Just to uh, add on top of that, different biometric solutions have different um, vulnerabilities and the mm -hmm. level of spoofs yeah. they can take. Some solutions are better than others in some particular areas of uh, doing anti-spoofing. Some are worse. So we'll probably talk about more. Mm -hmm. So I think a short summary for that is uh, using a safe fingerprint sensor solution with uh, definitely a good encryption, good data protection, and also anti-spoofing is very important. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, we talked a lot about um, how convenient it is, right? And also how many people are turning towards this technology, but are we sacrificing any type of security for the convenience? Um, a question that comes up to mind, right, when, for example, with your iPhone, um, while it's easy to issue a new password when the old one has been compromised, what you can't really issue somebody a new finger for a fingerprint or an eye for an eye authentication. Is is there a sacrifice in conveniency with this um, solution? I think another thing that's important to realize the difference between um, a good biometric solution and something like passwords is passwords are stored in a certain form on the host that you're logging into and therefore are vulnerable to any attacks on that host or a server on the web. Um, fingerprint data, uh, if it's properly handled, is kept completely locally on your machine. And so in the sense of someone trying to steal fingerprints in any kind of scalable way, um, they can't really do that. They have to attack each individual machine separately, even assuming that that's possible. Uh, our solution has got very strong encryption on fingerprint templates, very strong encryption and communication between the host and the device. Um, so there aren't even any plausible attacks there for, this, for your Verimark solution. Um, but you know, even if you want to talk about fingerprints being left on the surface of your of your uh, of your machine, for example, because you've touched it, that involves a fairly skilled person coming to your machine and specifically going and messing with it, you know, and mm -hmm. doing something on your machine. Yeah. Um, and so it's not an attack that is going to affect millions of people. And, and is, you're not going to be someone that's just an innocent bystander who, you know, you got caught because somebody stole a giant database with a million passwords. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to be a, a targeted type attack. And our, our sensors also protect against these fake fingerprint attacks. So. It's, it's convenience and security when done correctly. It, it can be convenience and a lack of security when done poorly. And there are some solutions out there that are poor, uh, but you know we have a good solution and uh, mm -hmm. I think we can talk more about why that's a good solution. Yeah. And I think just to also add, I mean, that's the perfect key takeaway, right? All biometrics aren't created equal. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's the, the core of the bear mark because you know, Kensington partnered with Synaptics on really making sure that the security was uh, at the level of that convenience as well, at a very high level. So uh, making sure that you understand the why behind that. And, and of course, we'll get into that deeper as well throughout this presentation. Yeah. And like you mentioned, they're all different, right? So is there some type of standard that workplaces are using to implement their biometrics? Um, because there have been instances in the past where, you know, data has been leaked. Have there been 
practices and if they are, are is it a low standard or is it an okay standard? Is there a standard at all, um, Willie? Yeah, certainly. Um, we Microsoft have been uh, developing to make the OS uh, safe and also uh, convenient for the users. And it started with uh, Windows Hello back to uh, three years ago. And now today, uh, Windows Hello allows you to use um, facial and uh, fingerprint sensor to log in. And going further, they will extend it to um, uh, web authentication by your fingerprint sensor. And ultimately, we are seeing here in Microsoft plan to even extend it beyond uh, local authentication, however, incorporate with uh, cloud-based uh, uh, data uh, access. So that's a big example in Microsoft. And talking about Hello, uh, hello. Um, sorry, talking about Fido. Maybe uh, Ray, can you come in? Um, yeah, there's a there's a, a standard that has now been implemented on most of the major platforms, Windows, Chrome. You know, even even Apple is getting into uh, implementing the Fido standard for logging on to uh, web servers uh, using a, a locally a local device. And again, there are many types of these local devices, but um, it's a it's a standard in the W3C that's called WebAuthn, and it's uh, it's really exciting. And I, I think we can see this year <clears throat> starting to increase adoption of that kind of solution for logging into uh, remote uh, accounts. Another aspect is the performance and accuracy of the biometric devices. So the most talked about standards are including force reject and force accept rates, and those are the key that most of the OEM and, and users are looking at just to know how secure it is. Okay. All right. So moving forward with that, let's just kind of ease into biometrics adoption into the workplace. Um, so Spicer did a study that said 62% of companies are already using biometrics, right? Um, and another 24% plan to deploy it within the next two years. So for those customers that are planning to deploy or starting out in that journey, um, Phil, what would how, or how would a customer successfully plan to implement biometrics? Um, what are some considerations when um, they are rolling it out? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, so I think it really depends, one, on just you, the reseller, being able to champion the, uh, the consultation when you're, when you're talking to those end users, right? So the first big thing, especially with our, and I'll speak with just our bare mark solutions, is um, you've got to make sure that they're going to be using Microsoft-enabled devices, right? So unfortunately today, being that ours are Windows Hello enabled, um, it, it's going to make sure, it's going to keep it that it, it won't be compatible with uh, Mac OS at this time. So that'd probably be a big number one, making sure that they all have Windows-enabled devices. Um, and then from there, it's it's more of a what does that customer, that end user, what are they looking to do, right? So today, if they're looking for a passwordless ecosystem where they don't want to type in a password and they purely want to use it for Windows Hello and entering that device, then there you go. You have our Verimark solutions that can do that. But there's also a next level of, okay, maybe you want to utilize Windows Hello for business. So in that case, the end user, maybe they're on the Azure network, right? So maybe they want to use our reader to authenticate within that Azure cloud. Then of course we can also do that as well, um, and then again it also comes to the different types of readers we have, right? So our generation one reader is a match on uh, host versus the Verimark IT being match and sensor, right? So that just um, to simplify and make it as in a use case centric, um, it just makes it deploying to a large masses a whole lot easier if you go with our Verimark IT, which is match and sensor. Why? Because if that employee of theirs has multiple devices that they're trying to log on to and they all use the same Microsoft login, he can use it to set one time setup will allow him to access all of his devices, right? That generation one reader does not have that, which is why we really want to recommend the Veramark IT in those larger deployment um, types of areas. Um, the one thing though, if you really want to focus more on the gen one reader is if in those environments, maybe the customer wants to use Gmail or Facebook to set up um, for security measures, right? Which in that case, we recommend the generation one, which is FIDO U2F uh, fully certified. So um, just to kind of, again, layman's terms, um, if you're using a fake Gmail or Facebook, I'm sure that you've gotten that little alert that comes up and says, hey, for security purposes, can we get your phone number and we can send you a password where you could type it in to make sure it's really you, right? So a lot of us say, yeah, that sounds great. I definitely want to have a more secure environment. So in that situation, instead of having to get your password through a text, 
you can now actually use our generation one reader to uh, authenticate yourself in those situations so that way it goes oh it is you know philip or it is willie in that environment that is trying to access their gmail or facebook so again it's just really making sure you understand what your customers needs are and then from there dictating what the best solution is for them which of course right if it, it sounds daunting, but obviously using us, Kensington, to be your uh, your experts there in that field, we're always happy to accommodate that and make sure that we're there with you guys to have that conversation and dialogue. So thinking about customers um, and the people that are using the, this technology in the workplace, um, Bo, do you think that there are certain industries that use technology more, like public sector and government or education or do we see this movement where everybody in the workforce and you know not really depend on what area you work in are implementing biometrics? I think a lot of the organization already started implementing that and more and more people are uh, using that just because of the convenience and the security that it comes with it. Mm -hmm. So it just takes time to uh, implement that by all the IT organizations. Do you see, Phil, um, any any industries or verticals that are adopting it more than other, or do you agree that you know it's just kind of an uptick in the workforce in general? Yeah, you know, you know, we where we've seen Kensington as us have seen the most, uh, you know, people reaching out is definitely corporate, large corporate environments, right? The more people they have, that means the more juggling they have to do with passwords. So having a passwordless type of solution that can help make their lives easier is always a big win. So that's something that we always get a lot of, hey, you know, do you guys have something that can do this for us? Um, also, right, I mean, it, it just depends on the different verticals, right? Mm -hmm. Education tends to have lower budgets, but at the same time, we're also trying to incentivize that a one reader for me for a teacher could have give them access to multiple devices when they go into different classrooms, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe in a fed federal environment as well, like they tend to be very big on CAC readers, but at the same time, final implementation and readers and biometrics are also starting to take a bigger a bigger priority within the federal government as well. So there's definitely more and more uptick in that uh, in that division as well. But I think Willie had a couple more uh, recommendations you wanted to add as well. Well, um, I have the side information, which is very exciting that we are seeing mm -hmm. also seeing biometric adoption in consumer base in terms of door locks, mm -hmm. uh, which you don't, you don't see a lot in US, but however, it's become very popular in Asia, especially China and Korea. And we are mm -hmm. seeing more uh, adoption rates are happening in uh, other uh, Asian countries and with our technology that we're going to talk about uh, talk deeper later I think I believe that you will be seeing it more in the US coming very soon mm. and secondly uh, we do have a couple of interesting projects in very uh, traditionally but very very tough uh, industry uh, which is uh, automotive Mm -hmm. which is set up very high requirement in terms of security and so reliability and and so on and which we use exactly the same fingerprint sensor that we do with very much today uh, for this automotive opportunities so which can be a kind of endorsement uh, to the product as well mm -hmm. yeah and it sounds like we're really using it not more so in just the workplace, but in our lives in general, right? And we're slowly integrating in different aspects of, of our everyday living. So um, I definitely see that growing outside of workplace as well. Okay. So I know you guys mentioned a lot about the technology. So let's dive into more, I guess, like technical terms and, and understand the differences um, of these technologies and what to know and look out for. Um, so. We talked about anti-spoofing, but um, what is it and why does it really matter, Phil? So, good question. Uh, so, right, so the, I think the, the, the spoof, I guess, what's that terminology even mean? So the fact that like someone can duplicate your fingerprint, for example, and use that to authenticate themselves into your device, that is a spoof, right? So the fact that we are anti-spoofing means that someone can't just hack into your laptop or device or whatever it is and steal your template and then use it to make a essentially a fake finger to authenticate themselves into your device right so uh, that is specific to kensington and the synaptic technology that we work together on to really formulate a device that can do that right and that's something that's really big to talk about with your customers because i don't think that's something that's top of mind so making sure that you put that in in front of them and say hey this is the type of technology you're looking for when you're when you're um thinking of a bear mark reader so make sure you um, have, have more to say about that, uh, but of course I'll let Bo and, and Ray as well um, advise on, on, on that technology. 
Sure. Um, I, it, it is uh, it is a well-known attack that people have done where they've come and they've stolen a fingerprint by lifting it off of your you know drinking glass or your phone and creating a fake finger that can then be used to get into that phone mm -hmm. or sometimes computers. Um, it, it's again a local attack, but it, you want to protect every possible way of getting into your device. And mm -hmm. so it's a very it's a challenging problem because they do essentially have a copy of your fingerprint. And you could imagine that that could be used. And in fact, a lot of sensors don't protect against this at all. They just, they see that image of the fingerprint and they go, yay, it's you. Um, the synaptics technology that uh, Kensington is using uh, uses machine learning to tell the difference between real fingers and things that have been made out of materials like, you know, gelatin or, or printed ink on a piece of paper or uh, various other ways of constructing these, these fake fingers. Um, and so uh, it's, it's very well protected against those uh, because uh, it's, it's basically using a neural network to, to make this distinction between the two. A lot of other technologies for anti-spoofing uh, can also work, but sometimes they can be worked around. Mm -hmm. uh, but, when, but when you're looking at something where it's just looking at the actual image and it's saying, no, that's not really a finger, it doesn't, it, the machine has learned a difference. It, it's hard to get around that uh, compared to say, some of them will use IR to detect that it's live instead of, you know, something else. But there are ways to work around that. So there, there, are, there are many ways of doing anti-spoofing. Um, you know, naturally we think that ours is the best, but I, I can't, I can't tell you that there aren't other good ones. There are some other good ones. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, okay. I, it was, I mean, anti-spoofing is like very general and broad and can grow, can down depending on how it's being used in a solution, right? Um, so I think that is a great way to get introduced into anti-spoofing. Um, another question is with, uh, we talked about FIDO, but what is really the difference between the FIDO U2F and FIDO2, really, or, or anyone from Synaptics? Sure. Um, FIDO has uh, several standards. Uh, one of the, the very original one was made largely for phones. It was called UAF. U2F is the kind of token that you see for logging into Google accounts, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and then later on, it, it, was, it, it was very difficult to get wide adoption of that because how many people are gonna buy a particular device to go log into a yeah. Google account? Mm -hmm. But you, FIDO2, the, the dream of FIDO2 is that it's standardized across platforms. So your phones will have FIDO2, already do. Mm -hmm. your, your Windows PCs and Windows 10 already have this capability to do FIDO2. And there, it's not exactly that they're two separate things because the U2F tokens can be used inside the FIDO2 framework to, to also authenticate you remotely. You can still use that device you have to log into Google. Um, it's just now there's a standardized way of doing it. And so uh, the, that's that's the big difference. Web, it's built into your web browsers now that mm -hmm. they can talk to these devices. It's a, it's a web standard, it's a W3C standard. And that's the main difference with FIDO2. Um, it's, it's there for web authentication. So a, a more comprehensive way of uh, saying the web standards and you now can use it as the primary logging without leaving any footprint. Mm -hmm. But however, YouTube will be like a second factor. You have to True. key in the right password and then uh, insert the, uh, the uh, having the, the right fingerprint sensor uh, with uh, the remark key. Yeah. Yes, FIDO2 has both capabilities. Yes, right. it can do either yeah. one. Another, I guess, common difference that people want to know about is what? how does match and sensor increase security over match and host? Well, I mean, one concern that people have, uh, and you can protect against this, but in match on host, your fingerprint image has to go down to a computer. It's a big complicated piece of software and hardware. And the, the, it has to be matched in the operating system or some other part of the machine to some template that's also stored on your computer. And there are concerns that people have that uh, these templates can be stolen. You know, someone, if they install malware on your computer, might even be able to get your fingerprint image. Uh, so there are some attacks that, that match on host is vulnerable to, whereas a match on sensor, you're keeping the templates on the actual physical device. You're keeping your fingerprint images on the actual fingerprint images on the actual physical device. They never leave. Uh, and so 
uh, they're not susceptible to any kind of malware that might be installed on the host um, to, to losing your fingerprint information. To go back to your question about what happens if you lose it. Well, in a match on sensor, there's no plausible way you're going to lose that data. It, it's, it's physically locked into a device with encryption and hardware. Is even if you drop it on the, on the, the street or something and someone picks it up, they, they can't get into that, that device and somehow extract that data. Um, so it, the security of match on sensor is definitely uh, higher. Uh, match on host is still a good solution. You know, it, it, it not machines are not generally compromised at the level that would allow them to steal fingerprints, but it is a higher level of security. So uh, architecturally, uh, for with a synthetic uh, match on host solution, we add on security link, which is we, you can call it end to end security. Mm -hmm. We secure the uh, communication channel. Uh, by a special, a special encryption, and we also do the uh, data encryption uh, to make sure, even though this is mesh on host solution, it's still very safe. Uh, ultimately, if you have a mesh on sensor, mesh on sensor uh, solution, uh, your fingerprint data never leaves or still be uh, transferred uh, or stored out of the uh, fingerprint sensor. So I think that's kind of a little difference, uh, differentiation between mesh on host and mesh sensor. I think tying this back all again to some earlier questions as well and some of the standards that people are looking to have in the corporate environment. I think uh, more and more, especially with Microsoft, so, you know, people like Microsoft and stuff like that pushing for certain security levels, I think match on center is probably going to be where most of these environments are going to start going towards, mm -hmm. right? So having a bear mark IT key that can be a supplement for that, I, I think is a major advantage for us. And it also ties back to the, uh, the use case, right? Like I mentioned earlier, the match on host Right, if you're a single user who has a match on host key, you're gonna have to make sure you go on every single device to get yourself authenticated onto that for like a Windows Hello environment. But now with the match on sensor, you know you have to do it once to have access to all of your devices under that Microsoft login. Yeah. So again, with adoption into the workplace, um, there is a lot of different types of biometric security. Um, is there, do we recommend like fingerprint biometric security as the best way to implement biometrics in the workplace? Or should we consider other ones like retinal or like facial recognition or other implementations as well? Or are we safe to just use like fingerprint biometrics, uh, Phil? Sorry. Anyone? Yeah, no, no, I would just, I, I'll just quickly say that, um, you know, I think right now there's, there is, there's obviously other solutions to, for, for biometrics, right, facial recognition, eyes, et cetera, but at the end of the day, right, it's, those levels of solutions are probably going to be a, a higher cost as well, right, and it's mm -hmm. tougher to implement that in an IT administration, right, it's like, how do you put retinal on, on, on uh, devices that maybe don't have cameras, et cetera, right, so having a very easy USB dongle-esque, right, whether it's, you know, USB-A, I mean, that's something that's highly at a higher rate of standardization within all of our devices in the IT world. So I would say biometrics is a very easy way to implement a higher level of security. And also you're not taking away from the actual security itself, right? I would, it's just as safe as a, uh, you know, a retinal or, or a facial recognition. Right. Mm -hmm. I think we are should move into. We talked a lot about Veramark, right? Um, so let's talk about Veramark and um, solutions to implement biometric security. Um, so Phil, do you want to talk a little bit about Veramark and how it ties into data protection um, in biometrics? Yeah, sure. So uh, I mean, obviously, what you guys are seeing is is our newest uh, solutions, the Veramark IT. But just to take it one step back, um, right? The Veramark solutions are they're right now tied into two different uh, parts. So we have our Veramark Gen 1 and then our Veramark IT, right? I mean, I, I think the things that I really want to take, hopefully you guys can take away, is that one, both of them are going to be Windows Hello approved, right? So that means that these are going to be all allowed to use as access points for your Windows enabled devices, right? And they both have that. More so, they both have Windows Hello for business for those Win 10 um, OSs out there as well, right? Which I had mentioned earlier, the Win Windows Hello for business allows you to have access to that Azure cloud network if you're um, IT deploys that type of cloud network. So um, they both have that, right? So that's great. That's one, one aspect of it. The second aspect now is the FIDO set, uh, intricacies of those, right? So that, that's where things start to dive, dive a little bit differently for each of the solutions. The Gen 1 being FIDO U2F, right? So now you're going to allow to be using that for second authentication, like I mentioned earlier on the Gmail access for second level of authentication or Facebook, et cetera, for those types of services. 
Whereas the Verimark IT will not have those capabilities today, merely only because of the um, access for just, uh, um, for it's, it's not gonna have the CTAP portion of FIDO, right? So you're not gonna be able to use it for second level authentication today due to the fact that it just, it's more on, on the Windows Hello centric. centric. Um, and then after that, it's the match and host versus the match and sensor, which I had mentioned earlier as well, our Gen 1 being match on uh, host, and then the Verimark IT with an added level of security for match and sensor as well. So that gives you a nice little breakdown on, on the differences between our Gen 1 and our Gen 2 Verimark IT. Mm -hmm. I would also add that, um, as we mentioned before with FIDO2, it is built into the platform now. And so having an external device and having it built into the platform at the same time um, is, somewhat redundant. And so uh, that's another reason why the, the current uh, Veramark IT is not is not doing FIDO is because it's built into the Windows Hello infrastructure now, whereas it was not before uh, in earlier times. Mm. So have we, with Veramark, obviously we've, we've used Veramark and sold Veramark before and we're coming out with Veramark IT. Uh, what are some use cases scenarios you've seen people use Veramark in, Bill? Yeah, um, you know, I would say the number one, I would say just in general, is being these larger corporations who are saying, you know what, we're tired of managing all these passwords. You know, at mm -hmm. the end of the day, these are all organizations that truly are, are all in on Windows, right, and all in on Microsoft. So um, they don't have really any MacBooks in their, in their environments. So they're looking for like something that's just going to take away all the employee struggles of having to deal with a bunch of different passwords. And that's been the number one use case or the pain point that these guys are trying to solve is, is having a solution like that that can just make their lives a whole lot easier, which is where Veramark, again, is just a quick, easy solution for them to take care of that problem, right? So that's where I've been, I would see probably the biggest priority uh, within these larger corporations. And then from there, right, I mean, there, there is a level now of privacy acts going out there that's saying, hey, or data protection acts that are saying, hey, you corporation, you need to do a better job of managing your data because we can't continue to have hacking happen at such a regular basis. Right, so then that biometric level of security um, now becomes into play where they're also seeing this as a huge advantage with the Veramark solution, right? So um, I would say those are probably the two bigger takeaways for why corporations are getting involved with Veramark. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, another, I would assume another reason that corporations are adopting is the return on investment. Is there, is there some type of ROI that co companies get when they implement this technology? So. Um, so that's, again, a really good question. I would say if, if you're looking at the ROI, it's it's the time that someone's, that like an IT manager saves from having to go out to that employee. Oh, I locked myself out of my laptop again, right? Like how many times does an IT manager do that on a daily basis? We've done research where we've seen upwards of like a hundred times in a day where people are, especially these larger corporations, I'm talking a thousand plus. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how many times someone calls and says, hey, sorry, lost my, I forgot my password. Oh, okay, forgot my password, the VPN, login the device, all this and that, like it, it just, all that stuff is hours of the IT manager spending on, on things he should be spending his time on, right? So mm -hmm. so having that that top cost savings of having a, a, a bear mark reader that saves them time and costs on that and where they can essentially say, hey, just, yeah, there's never a point where they lose their finger, right? So uh, it, it gives them that 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 safe feeling of, hey, you know what, I am I now have my IT manager, my IT organization is spending time on fixing uh, you know, higher higher level priority problems. So also with Veramark, um, like how does it work? Does it does it work with Mac? Um, does it what browsers does it work with? Can you elaborate on these functions? Yeah, yeah. So so like I had, I had mentioned earlier as well. So this is uh, being that they're both Windows Hello certified. That's going to mean that they're only going to work on Microsoft enabled devices, Windows enabled devices, right? So unfortunately, we'll not be working with MacBook today. But um, moving forward, we do plan on um, developing even more. Uh, fingerprint readers like our, our first in gen generation Verimark and the IT that will uh, potentially take out Windows Hello more of a full FIDO capabilities, which again, at that point would allow access to like a MacBook, et cetera. So uh, we do have that in our in our sites, I should say. Um, so yeah, so I would say that's probably one of the bigger issues. And then our bigger, uh, making sure that you have that standardization across your IT uh, deployment. And then also another one on regards to the browsers, I believe Firefox, uh, Google Chrome, uh, Microsoft Edge, um, and I'll leave it to the Synaptics uh, team members here if, if there's if there's another browser that I may be missing. That's a pretty good summary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so with 
um, Vera Mark, uh, we talked about how it eases the IT side of it. What about the installation process with implementing biometrics? Is it pretty simple to implement, install in your organization, or um, what would you say, Willie? This is completely, it's very, very comprehensive. Um, all user needs to do is plug in the uh, fingerprint sensor and uh, the user can choose uh, for Windows 10, you can go to your sign option and enroll the uh, Windows Hello fingerprint uh, through that app, a little app, and you will be able to join the Windows, Windows Hello login and also the web authentication. So that's how easy it is. Yeah, I mean, that sounds pretty easy. Like I would be able to do it by and set it up myself probably. Um, so very helpful. Yeah, we, we do have uh, setups like on instructions and all that on our Kensington website. Like a, to Willie's point though, extremely simple. I mean, point where you just have to download a quick driver, it's ready to go. And that point you're just going through, what, like if it's Windows Hello, getting that set up, you just follow the instructions. It takes literally two or three steps. It's like setting up a new password. Um, it's, it's, it's really simple. Mm -hmm. So I know we, we did have Veramark before, and now we're, we're launching Veramark IT. Um, uh, from what you've heard, what, what has Kensington found and learned about biometric security from Veramark to Veramark IT? Yeah, so I, I think the, the key takeaways, right, with the Veramark IT, like I had mentioned earlier, so the match and sensor, right, is adding an, even just a little bit higher level of security, right, which is huge. And then more so the implementation process of the fact that it is match and sensor. So again, if you're in an environment where you have, you know, you have to log into multiple devices under your login, I mean, having a key that you can do at once versus, uh, you know, three or four times, I mean, think about the time savings there as a bear, as an IT administrator to not have to deal with having to set up a password over and over and over again. So that's where you're going to see the major advantages of the Veramark IT. Um, and then one, obviously one very big caveat as well, over the generation of one reader is that the Veramark IT is TAA compliant, right? So those federal organizations out there who mandate a TAA compliant product, you can now have that with the Veramark IT as well. So I know time is cutting out soon, so um, we'll summary, summarize our findings um, and then move on to the raffle. Um, but we still have a lot more questions, and if you have questions, you can always submit them, um, and we'll get them answered for you. Uh, don't forget, we'll also be sending up a follow-up email, so there's going to be a lot of resources and assets following up. Um, so with our webinar, I do want to, um, I'll ask Phil the first one, and then Synaptics the next one. As a recap, Phil, what should customers consider when implementing biometrics in the workforce? Uh, really good question. Again, I, I think when you're when you're in those discussions with your customers, just again, it, it's it's always going to be helpful for us, especially when you come back to us like, hey, you know, can Kensington help me with with my customer with X, Y, and Z? So the big things that we'd always ask is just one, what type of device are they do they have in, uh, deployed in their environment, right? That's a, that's a key number one, and it'll make it a whole lot easier for us to figure out what the next steps are. Um, and then from there is at the end of the day, what's their pain point? Like, what what are you asking them? Like, just be very honest with them and saying, what are you guys trying to solve? And then from there, we can we can piggyback a story around how the Veramark can help them with that pain point, right? Because at the end of the day, we're here to take care of our customers' problems. So I want to make sure we don't get down to, to down, you know, a path of where the customer just sits there and goes, I, I don't really need that. So let them tell you what their pain point is. And then from there, we will construct a solution for them to make sure we get that care of. Yep. All right. Great answer. Um, Willie? What, uh, how does a customer choose the right biometric solution for their organization? And I, I would open that up to the entire Synaptics team as well. I think the most important thing is that you have to choose a fingerprint sensor with a very secure uh, security. Um, mm -hmm. Why I repeat that? Because uh, synapt all Synaptics solution today, no matter uh, is with the automatic matching sensor uh, solution or a matching host solution, we all do a secure link, which encrypt the uh, communication channel from your device to your host, which is your PC. And also we encrypt the data uh, with 200, AES 256 data encryption. With the double, double encryption, uh, double security, that uh, provides you the uh, ultimate uh, safe uh, product uh, if you like to use a fingerprint sensor with your uh, daily work. Sounds good. So that uh, wraps up our training. But again, if you still have questions, please submit to them to advantage at kensington.com 
for the question navigation pane and we will get the answers for you. Um, if you have any questions about um, biometrics or getting a sample in one of your customer's hands, please reach out to us here. Um, we have a list of resources for you um, and you can go to Advantage for any questions as well.